Welcome back to the FNZ 90 plus free podcast where free football supporters take a look into the dressing room chatting to former professional footballers about their experiences on and off the pitch. I'm your host Ashley Simons. Tonight I'm joined by my esteemed colleagues Tux and Bex. Great to get the first episode out of the way boys however I should let you know that the swear jar was uh, filled by our first guest. So uh, <laughs> how are we doing this, this evening? Yeah good mate all good. What about yourself? Yeah. Yeah, not too bad. Bex, how are you doing, mate? Yeah, I'm good, mate. Good, sort, all good. Sort those beers out, have you? Not yet, no. It's uh, after. It's on a late delivery for John, so we'll, we'll see if we can do better with Tony this time. <laughs> Lovely job. So episode one got off to a fly. John Salako, Crystal Palace legend, of course, shared his stories with us, and there were some great ones in there. Tonight we're joined by a player who spent 16 years out of 18 in his career in the English Football League, making 515 appearances in the league and cup competitions. Tony Dinan. Tony, welcome to the show. How are you doing tonight, mate? I'm good, mate. Thank you very much for having me and preparing to listen to me, my stories, to be honest with you. <laughs> won't, anyway. I'm looking forward to it, mate. It's good to hear. So, Tony, as you're new to the show, um, you won't be familiar with the format, so I'll give you a quick rundown of how it works. Just imagine you're in a pub with three blokes and for some strange, unapparent reason, you need to, to impress us with your best football stories uh, you've got in the locker. Having played for yeah, a number of different clubs over the years, I'm sure you've got some belters. Is that okay? I, I have. It's just I've got to think of them now. <laughs> well that's why we're here mate we'll help you along the way uh tux will kick us off with a question we'll go from there all right yeah yeah brilliant so tony thanks uh first and foremost thanks for coming on um before we get into your career um as a professional footballer i just want to sort of delve into um your youth career really um obviously you know with the but you know but before that i mean with your your time as a child growing up um what were your experiences? Um, you know, did you ever go to games with your mum and dad? You know, maybe you know family members. Maybe, you know, what was your experience of watching football, and what was football like for you as a child? Um, I'll be honest with you. I was one of them football mad kids. If I'm honest with you, um, everything had to be revolved around football. And every now and again, um, my dad would take me to the Newcastle match. Um, when we could probably afford it, I think looking back, um, it wasn't every week, but obviously it was a treat when we did go, sort of thing. Um, and then, like I say, I was just asked that's I was started playing football down the park when I was about nine, ten year old. Um, heard that there was some trails going, um, one Saturday down at World's End, uh, on the big playing fields down there when you could play football in parks, them days. Um, and then went and played the game, and I used to be a centre forward. I played up front and scored three. We won three nil, and the team signed me up uh, called West End Boys Club, which is just a little t- a little place in Newcastle, um, West End, the Newcastle sort of thing. So um, same for them, and then I just played with them because all my mates as well. Where you just want to play with your mates when you're that age, and things don't really you don't think of anything else to be honest with you. Um, and then I got approached from Wars End Boys Club, the famous Wars End Boys Club, come to me and says, do you want to, what do you want to do when, you, when you're older? I said, play football. And they said, well, if I want to do that, you need to, you need to sign for us. I said, I mean, just a boys club, you know what I mean? But the amount of players that have come through that, I went to a meeting, uh, it's an anniversary, sorry, about three years ago. And I think there's about 85 professional footballers there, from Alan Shearer, Peter Beersley, players like all play for this boys club uh, Michael Carrick and and things like that um, so I end up signing for them and I'd sign for them and within a month I think within a month I was 11 12 year old I was at um, Nottingham Forest School of Excellence Everton's and Newcastle's within the space of a month so give me well, a the, platform so we'll delve back into that uh, that obviously that youth career of yours because it's obviously quite famous from where you've come from um, but in terms of, you know, your family situation, um, what was it like growing up as a child and being involved within football? Did you know? Did, did you ever go to games as a child and maybe sort of have experiences from that that led you into your professional career? No, like I say, I went to the games when I could, um, or when my dad could take me, should I say? Um, but like I say, that was it. Really, just the the odd Newcastle game, should I say? I was always a Newcastle fan. Um, but like I say, it's just the, the times 
when I was allowed to go, when I was able to go sort of thing. Like I say, it wasn't every week, it was every now and again and stuff like that. And and obviously when you when you go to a big ground as a as a kid, you just remember walking up the steps, I suppose, for the first time, seeing the pitch and thinking how like amazing it is with all the fans and the crowd and you know what I mean and the, and the pitch itself and you just think to yourself, wow, you know what I mean? It's it is um yeah, it is exciting times, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, so obviously uh, going on from the to the Walls End Boys and then uh, into Newcastle Academy as well. Um, I think you even had a spell um, in Sweden, I think, if I'm right, and you know on loan. Um, but Bex obviously take this part of the interview as well, so I'm sure he's got some really good uh, questions regarding that youth career of yours. So yeah, Bex, take it away, mate. Yeah, so um, as you said, Walls End Boys Club is probably one of the hotbeds of football and talent, not just in the northeast, sort of in the country. What what sort of did you learn there that really sort of set you up to have the football and career you did and so many that had the football and careers that they have had from there? It's, it's, I don't know. I just, I don't think it's just Wall's End in general. I must admit, I'm not a big fan of this academy football, if I'm honest, whether we're going to get onto that in a bit, I don't know, but I'm just getting out there now. Um, I think the academy football for me stops players doing what we were able to do at our age, where... Obviously, I was one of the fortunate ones that was I was half decent in it, I suppose. But it allowed us to go and play our normal football, should I say, on a, on a Sunday against players who probably weren't as good as us. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, you know what I mean? Fourteen-year-old me against a, another fourteen-year-old who wasn't at my level, should I say? It, it, it was now, I suppose, a big class as academy level. But me playing against him was allowing me to develop myself. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, sort of getting an understanding and, you know, yeah. you're playing against sort of, maybe they might know that you're a little bit better than they were and, you know, they yeah. might do those things that maybe, you know, certain footballers would do to try and stop you from from playing your game. Whereas in academy, and they're sort of all sort of taught to play maybe a similar it's, style of football. Yeah. And to me, I just think a 14-year-old centre midfielder now at Man United playing against a 14-year-old centre midfielder at Everton or Man City or Liverpool, they're both going to be exceptional players. Are they going to cancel each other out and stop each other developing? I don't know. Yeah. Whereas I was, allowed to, I, was, I was allowed to, should we say, looking back, take advantage of these lesser players yeah. and improve my own game. Yeah, exactly. And, um, but, uh, who came through with you at your time? Is there any sort of players sort of maybe a few years older, a few years younger, or even sort of same same age bracket as you, did anyone sort of come through, you know, to go on to be, in a, to make a professional career like yourself or, you know, was yeah, it yeah, just a... There was tons. Um, yeah. The year, I mean, it was then, but was the, the, the year above me, we had Alan Thompson, yeah. who went on to play for Newcastle Boat and Celtic in England. There was Robbie Elliott, left back, played for Bolton, Newcastle. Steve Watson was the right back, who played for Newcastle, Villa and Everton. That was the three from their year. The year above them was Lee Clark, and they're playing for Sunderland, Fulham, and Newcastle. And yeah, the list. I'll be honest with you, the list just goes on. And I think before him, uh, right, then the, again, the list just goes on. To be honest with you, there's loads. Um, do, there's, do, you, do you think it's helped where Wolves End was? You know, Newcastle and you know the North is quite renowned for you know lads who just absolutely love their football. They eat, sleep, breathe in football. Do you think it may have not worked quite as well elsewhere? And as you've said, you know, academy football's changed so much. Do you think it helped you grow up as a person as opposed to just the footballer? Yeah, I, I, 100%. Like I say, I mean, I'm so proud of where I came, where I came from, to be fair, Newcastle. And I loved every minute where I grew up as a kid. Stuff like that. But at the same time, you could, you could probably look at it and say, well, because it was a, was it a deprived area as such? Did we not have what the other kids had and everything else? So we just made our own fun and fun for us was playing football on the park because it was free and it didn't cost any money uh, and you all needed a ball. So whether that was why there was so much up that end doing that, I don't know. Just making things up as I go along. But I'm just thinking of a reason. I don't know. Um, I really don't know. Because like I say, we didn't have computers and things like that up there. So we just made, got together with my mates to go and play football. I think, you know, you know as, as you said it, it's clearly, it's clearly a tried and tested formula, the amount of players. And I think it's not just a case of players getting them into football and they're being there for a few years, like players you think of Alan Shearer, Steve Bruce, Peter Beardsley. They go on to play for big clubs and have really long, successful careers. And including yourself, you know, you had a 
you went on, maybe you didn't quite get the chance at Newcastle, but you went on to have a, a good career at Stock, Stockport and many other clubs. Do you think sort of that helped you, uh, you, know, you know, establish yourself and maybe set up a long career for yourself as well? Yeah, I think so. Like you say, like I said earlier about the, um, I mean, Newcastle looking back, when I left there at 19, was I good enough to play for them? No. Look, I'm, I'm honest. I wasn't good enough at the time. No, of course I wasn't. So I had to go down to Stockport in League One um, and, and, and get a game there sort of thing and learn the ropes of professional football because it's totally different to reserve team football, I'll tell you that. And just get used to playing again in front of a crowd, even though it wasn't a massive crowd. It was a crowd at the end of the day. And again, for some people, it can be a bit daunting, but... It's just from there when you, you get the you get the bug and you just think I want to do it again I want to do it again and it, and then you just like I say because I was at that level um I, I stayed there for six years and we managed to get the championship so you end up learning from other players as well um, yeah that's why the experienced players come into it to be fair to to, to coach the younger ones do you mean along the way and and help them deal with certain things um and like I say it just it just gives you the the training so you learn basically a hell of a lot in your first two or three years as a young pro. Um, which again just stand in good state going forward. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, speaking of Stockport, you know, a, a big club at, in you know in your time coming through. Um, sadly, falling on harsher times now. But you know, at, at the time, and, and we've been on many away days, and we've seen the revival of Stockport, um, which is really you know quite pleasing to see them sort of get back on their feet. Um, quite a notable thing I've seen doing my research is all good podcasters do um you had quite a rival with manchester city and it's quite crazy to think that the parallels between stockport and manchester city who were you know in the same division at, at your time of playing and how di- different and scary football has been since then tony in, in essence like we've seen that you played for a number of clubs over the years but would stockport be the one that you would have called home Definitely, 100%. So obviously you spent six, you said you spent, was it six years originally and then you obviously rejoined yeah. him at a later date. But just talk us through those years with Stockport. I know you, you said you joined him in League One, you obviously got promoted, but, you know, we'd argue that, you know, in your final season at Stockport, it's probably your best on a football pitch in terms of, of where you were going at the time. Yeah, 100%. That was... Um... The season for me where probably you could say the last, the, the, the five years before it, it probably paid off for me that final season. Um, I turned up there as a young 19-year-old kid, like I say, got into the team early in the season through an injury, stayed in the team, went on to play 200 and odd games over five, six years, got promoted, uh, promotion stuff, semi-final of the League Cups, and just playing with, like I say, the older players and learning off so many, like Gordon Cowan's turning up on loan. And playing some matches with Gordon Cowns. I remember watching him in the 82 Cup final, you know what I mean? And, uh, European Cup final, sorry. And you're playing with Gordon Cowans on the same pitch and you're thinking, you just learn so much for them sort of players. Like Chris Morse and, and Tom Bennett and things like that. And like I say, Paul Cook ended up turning up from from Wolves and Coventry. And you just play with players like, and you learn so much. And like I say, that final season, I think everything just seemed to click for me personally. Um, but as well, like I say, the mention about Man City and stuff like that and the, I think there was there was a season or two when we were in the championship and they were in League One, um, and then you look at it now and it's just absolutely ridiculous what's happened there. But I'm hoping Jim uh, Jim Gannon, a former teammate of mine uh, from Stockport, I'm just hoping he he deserves to get them back up there. If anyone's going to get them there, I think it's it deserves to be him because, like I say, he's put so much into that club as a player um, and he's tried on numerous occasions as a manager to revive them. And I'm just hoping now can be the time when he can. The thing is with with Stockport, it's, it kind of simultaneously with, not with you leaving, but in the sense that after you left Stockport, it was it was just seemed to be downhill for them. Would you agree? Yeah, hundred percent. That, um, that season, well, I've chatted about uh, to Kevin Cooper the other day. Actually, he was a former player as well. Um, it was mental. That 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 season, I think we were fourth or fifth. I think on Boxing Day in the Championship, we beat Bolton away, beat Man City away. We beat Wolves at home and stuff like that. And we are sixth on fifth, fourth or fifth, I think it was, on Boxing Day. And the manager pulled us in the office. There was about seven that, were, that he pulled in the office because he was trying to get a new three-year contracts. He said, if I can keep you seven together and add a couple 
like keep the main, keep the keeper, two centre halves, full back, midfielder, forward, and keep the spine together, sort of thing, and add a few to it. Um, I think we can probably go somewhere, sort of. I mean, look at what's happening now. The teams that are going for the Premier League, you know, what I mean, and we were fourth or fifth on Boxing Day, so it was no fluke as such. But the chairman wasn't interested. He was not interested in keeping us together. And the manager turned around, and to be fair to him, he turned around and says. The manager's not interested in keeping his, but I'll just be fair to you. If, I can, if teams come in for his, I'll tell you. Because that's another thing in football. You, you you can play for a team for three years, not knowing who's came in for you, who's interested. Because if the club don't want to tell you or sell you, they won't. Yeah. Um, but after that, he was as honest as the days long, that manager, Andy Kilner. And the, team, the teams that come in for me that season, he, was a, he told me within 10 minutes, he'd ring me up. Portsmouth just put a bid in for you, but rejected it because it's not enough. No problem. Oh, I'm on a saying you. No, I'm not selling you. No problem. Barnsley, Forest, and then it turns out after after the chairman's meeting with the manager, I think at the end of that season, it was talking again with Portsmouth again and didn't end up going and boat. Um, and then I think it was a fifth or sixth game into that season, we played Preston away, drew one one. I came off the pitch. The manager grabbed me and says, "I've sold." He says, "You've been sold during the game." He yeah. sold me after the match. Yeah, so. I go to the dressing room. Gaff was like chatting about the game and great result, lads. One, one, one at Preston, this, that, and that. Let's kick on everything. Oh, and by the way, better tell you now because you'll find out sooner or later. We've sold in the Wolves. So, but in terms of, I was going to ask you really, what were your crazy dressing room stories? But that's probably got to be one of the craziest ones I've ever heard. So you played, you played a match, you come off, and you've yeah. been sold to Wolves. I mean, did you know anything about it? No, it was during the game. That's unbelievable. That that's unbelievable. You don't have to go if you don't want to, but he says, obviously, they've come in for you. He's accepted the bid. You're free to talk to him. So, in terms, of, in terms of your career then, was that a bit of a shock? Um, yeah, oh, yeah, definitely a shock coming off the pitch, yeah, massively. Um, it shocked me moving on. I'm not too sure, if I'm honest, because I think... If I remember rightly, I signed the new three-year contract, I think, at the end of that season, because I'd scored, I think, ended up with 13 goals that season um, from midfield, like in the Championship, which, again, if you're doing that now, you're worth 25 million, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, it, was, it wasn't a shock. I was going to, I think I was always going to get, once a club gave me a new contract, I think, I think it was more of them having a more of a bargaining tool above other clubs, rather than me just having 12 months left. Yeah, uh, that, more it, of an investment then. Yeah, 25 at all with the 12 months left after just going 13 goals in the championship, you could probably get yourself a few quid somewhere. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I think them giving me the three year contract extension sort of thing, I, think, I was thinking in my head, maybe the, they are going to get rid of me soon. And sure enough, they did. So is it fair to say once you left Stockport, you were really hoping to find a club where you could, you know, set up sticks again and, and make it, you know, a new home? Yeah, definitely. Um, again, Looking back, that, that move it's alone, I was 25 years old, and that's the move for me that actually, I didn't, re- I didn't as strange as is, I didn't realise that I was 25 years old that football was all about making money. Truthfully. Because to me, it was, a, it was, a, it was my passion. It, was, it, was, it wasn't a job. It was a, it, was a, it was a joy more than anything else. But I just wanted to play football. Yeah. yeah. So I wasn't, I didn't go there for the money. I didn't go there for the money. I didn't go there for the money. Um, I went there to play football. But it wasn't until I got to Wolves, I realised after the, dre- the people in the dressing room there that people weren't interested in playing as many games as they could and, and playing well and this, that and that. They were, just, or they were just worried about the money, which I found was disheartening, if I'm honest with you. So would you say that you, you kind of like fell out of love with football at that moment? A little bit, yeah, because like I say, I just, I lost all, what's, what's this all about sort of thing. I thought it was about being a footballer. I thought that was the prize sort of thing and doing what people said to me in the past, you, you lived my dream as I lived my own. I mean, it was mine as well. And yeah. um, like I say, it, it, it just it knocked the stuff out of me a little bit, I must admit, when I went to Wolves. As much as I enjoyed the first three or four months there, um, after that, I just knock the stuff out a little bit. Obviously, we, we, we touched upon your highlights of your career just briefly there, obviously, with Stockport. Um, so, I mean, looking back 
on the whole of it. I mean, you won promotions with Stockport, Wigan, Stoke um, over the years. And I mean, talk to me through those sort of highlights, obviously winning promotion and, you know, being a part of a successful team, not just one, but, you know, three. Um, you know, give, give me your thoughts and your memories um, towards that sort of uh, part of your career. They were, all, they were all really exciting because I managed to win the league with Wigan. We come second with Stockport and we went through the playoffs with Stoke. And so three, I had three different, different ones, obviously. But, and people say, if you're going to win the playoff, if you're going to win promotion, sorry, the best way to do is through the playoffs. It's more exciting. Yeah. But I must admit, the times where, when we won the league at Wigan, we, I think we only got beat four times that season because Paul Jula put a really good squad together. And... Um, we were too strong for everyone. I think we were with 102 points or something. Um, and then the table come second was Stockport because we had the um, Coca-Cola Cup run to the semi-final, FA Cup fifth round, LDV semi-final or something. We had a massive fixture pile up at the end of the season. We ended up playing, I think it was Sun, um, Saturday, Monday, Thursday, Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, I think it was the last six games. Crikey. So it was proper full on. And so that was exciting as well because you had six games in the space of 10 days, 12 days, whatever it was. And it was just reeling off the games. And so it, that was exciting as well. That was like a six game playoff sort of thing because we were going for promotion. And um, we sealed it on the Tuesday night at Chesterfield. Um, so yeah, that got us into the championship. And then we went to Luton on the side to Drew 1 1, but obviously we got promoted. And then but exciting. And again, the playoffs were stoked. I went there on loan from Wigan. Um, we were 10th the season when I joined league. We were 10th, I think, with about 10 games to go, I think it was. And um, Paul, you were pulling me and says, we can't go up, we can't go down. They want you on loan until the end of the season. Do you want to go? And I says, yeah. Um, so I went there and again, it was a great experience with the playoffs itself and, and things like that. So it was really good, really good. Yeah. So out of those, um, probably those three successful stints of your career, um, yeah. what would you say is probably the most favourite one out of those promotions? Oh, good question, actually. Um, I, th- I want to say Stockport because Stockport's my own sort of thing, but yeah. I must admit that the, the season, yeah, it's got to be the Stockport season. It's got to be. As, as much as, like I say, at Wigan, winning the league with 100 and odd points and stuff like that and was a great season. Stockport that year was up, like I say, it was just unbelievable because of the, the cup runs were chucked in there and, and like I say, to, to, to get the semi final of the League Cup as well and get promoted and like I say that I was only twenty or was I twenty one, twenty two I think as well. So it was it was a massive and like I said, they say the first one always sticks for you and it does. So uh for me personally, um a highlight when I've seen you play live uh, was actually on loan at Ipswich. Um mm. I had a season ticket at the time there at Portman Road. Um, I remember many fans actually questioning how big your shorts were. I don't know if you ever knew about this. Um, but um, <laughs> was, there, was there any reason for this or was it just mainly just to keep the, uh, the, the Tony Dinning rolling, rolling pin safe? No, no, she would have got massive on. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's what we thought. We thought it was uh, to keep the rolling pin safe or not, the, the, the family one. <laughs> <laughs> No, it was, more, it was more the other side. My arse was huge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, so that was quite a funny sort of time, really, from um, when we was um, going to Ipswich and obviously watching you play for for the town. But um, obviously, so from what I can remember as well, you you know you represented uh, around sort of fifteen, sixteen sort of clubs during your career. Um, mm. You know, some of which have been you know promotions and things like that, and then obviously in the in the non league as well with Chester and teams like that. So, I mean. Compared to professionally playing, what's it like re- representing a club that is well going to be semi-professional players? You know, playing on pitches that are waterlogged and you know things like that in all weathers. Um, so, was that something you enjoyed, or was it a, a bit of a far cry from where you came from? I think no, no. Well, it was it was definitely a far cry from the championship years and yeah. like I say, the pitches and stuff like that. But. It was a game of football to me, and a game of football to a game of football to me. But the, the thing I struggled with the most, I think, going um, playing part time, should we call it, or semi pro, whatever they call it, the thing I struggled to, to, to handle was the um, the dedication of the players, to be honest with you. But then you think to yourself, it took me a while to actually for it to register because I, I used to get. 
this is this is a true story by the way. I was player manager, player assistant manager, sorry, at Bridge North. Yeah. And uh, well, Lee Mills, former centre forward from Bradford and Wolves, who's manager, and um, we played a team on the Saturday, and we got through the qualifying rounds, the FA Cup. And the right back came to me on the Tuesday night and says, "Dins, I can't make train. I can't make the game on Saturday." I said, "Well, we've got the FA Cup third qualifying round. It's worth four and a half grand at the club." He says, "Yeah, I can't go. I can't make it." Like I was like, "Oh, why well, you got a wedding on or something?" He says, "No, but I'm going to the B Festival." <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, "What?" Um, I said, "You can tell the manager. I'm not telling them." So. He told the manager, he went to the V Festival, he turned up the game on the Tuesday and night. He was still smacked off his tits, like to be fair to him. Yeah. And the manager played him and dragged him off after 10 minutes because he gave two goals away. But I, So that's why I couldn't, I couldn't get my head around their mentality. But then I'm thinking to myself, they're going to get paid peanuts. I can't expect them to put the life on hold for Bridge North Football Club, do you get me? How do you yeah. punish a player, though, if you've got that in that instance... If you've got a player that goes AWOL or something like that, you know, yeah. a professional club, if a, if a player goes off the, you know, off the radar, they get fined, mm. you know, how many weeks' wages, yeah. drop from mm. the team and all that sort of stuff. But how, mm. even as a manager, you know, you've been yeah. a player manager at Bridge North, how do you deal with that? How do you punish that player? You can't because he's only getting 40 quid a week. What do you do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? He's turning up and playing for 40 quid. So, what, what, what can you say? Like I say, that's what I struggle with the most because I'm, I'm expecting. In them to give Bridge North 100% of their time like I used to do every single day work but again it was at a different level completely and you're thinking well you can't expect him to put his life on like said, he's going to get he's only a young kid he's going to enjoy himself why shouldn't he go to the I mean, but I was expecting to to have his heart and soul in, in our team yeah and, yeah and not go and enjoy himself and live his life well it, it's so that's the that's the main difference at their levels to be honest with you the quality you see players like I mean Jamie Vardy's a Prime example. You see players like at them levels and they can do it, but it's whether they've got the, the heart and the ambition to want to yeah. do it or they're hungry enough to do it. And because there is some very quality, like talented players at that level, but it just depends on what, what, their, what their mentality is and what their take on life is. Yeah. See, Tony, I just wanted to pick you up on one of those things. So you, you talk about hunger in football. Obviously, mm. that's, you, you, it came back round to going back to Stockport. And, and having that, that final stint there with the club. Am I right in thinking that was the season when the, the club went a club record nine straight wins without conceding back in 2007? Yeah, it was, yeah. Um, we're saying, again, I mean, Stockport, even though we're League Two, the players that they had there, I mean, Ash Williams was sent to half, went on to Swansea. We had Pilkington there, who went on to Norwich and Cardiff. We had John Ruddy on loan in goal from Everton. We had Wayne Hennessy on loan from Wolves. Um, Tommy Rowe was just coming through. A young lad left back, YTS. He ended up going to Doncaster and Wolves and Peterborough. So, like I say, looking back, there was a young bunch of decent quality players there, Jermaine. You know but, yeah, that was the um, that was the nine in the row. Um, what was more special for me, I don't, I don't know what thing, but I'd done the same when I was at Wigan. Yeah. That season, we, that season we won the league. We went nine games unbeaten, not, didn't concede the goal. So there's, there's two teams done it, and I was lucky enough to be involved with both of them. So, that is, so you, you were the, you were the reason why you got two I nine in a row. Yeah. There was a pattern emerging. What? There's a pattern emerging. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, Quality. Quality. It was just nice to be involved with it. Like I say it was um, again good memories, and, and like I say the, but the best thing with the Wigan was we had a, um, a clause in the bonuses. That the win bonus doubled every um, after three consecutive wins. So, as you can imagine, yeah. the fourth <laughs> game, the fifth game, the sixth game, you can imagine. So, people were going down, <laughs> we're, we're striking deals with each other in the dressing room on the seventh game. Listen, if I'm on the bench, any chance you're going down in the last couple of minutes and let them get me up because you had to get on the pitch to get it. They really? Uh, uh, sneaky, yeah. sneaky, love that. You obviously, when you sort of found out how you felt about football, you know, about making money, is there anything, either being out of the game a little bit more now or in your later career, maybe you rediscovered your love for football? Is there anything that sort of rekindled it? Was it that season coming back to Stockport? Like you said, Stockport was your, your home, was going back mm. there, sort of something that really sort of maybe made you fall in love again with football a little bit? 
Um, in a way, I must admit, though, it's, I mean, over the last 10 years, should I say, there's, there's times where you miss it so bad it's untrue. And I know there's a lot going on about that. I mean, Craig Ballard has come out some the other day about that and things about being depressed or feeling depressed, should I say. But I just think it's, you just get so much um, pleasure from it at times, like I say, in the buzz and, the, in, and like everyone will say, this, every player will say the same thing. It's some for some of them and most of them it's not the three o'clock on a Saturday that they miss it's it's the Monday to Friday it's the yeah. it's everything else that goes with it you know what I mean and, and like you say then all of a sudden you you're not there anymore and you you know what I mean and it's just like well what, what do I do now sort of thing and um and some people unfortunately haven't got um anything to go to do you know what I mean and and and, yeah. and they, they, they haven't got anything to go to or the other thing Again, I'm not having to go at them as such, but some of them probably think they shouldn't have to go and do this or do that because they used to do this or used to have that. I mean, so yeah. it's a bit of a, it's one of them at the end of the day. But um, like I say, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, we all miss football when it's not on, um, especially in the summer when you're twiddling your thumbs for two months. But like you say, when you know you, you, you're not going to be involved ever again, it's hard to, sometimes hard to take. So you've yeah. obviously been retired since you were, I think it was 2011 that you retired, I think it was. Um, exactly. but you've obviously sort of, I don't know, you, you sound like you miss it. Um, is it is it something you still miss to this sort of day, even since, you know, retiring then? And is there anything that, you know, you kind of get up to now that kind of fills that void? Um, yeah, I'm, I watch it as much as I can. Yeah. And, um like I say, look forward to Sundays when the games are on the telly and stuff like that. And match, never miss match of the day. My missus goes mental, but it still goes on on every single the night. She knows the drill now. Um, but yeah, it's just, you do. You, you, you're always going to miss it. It's like doing something that you love for so many years, and then all of a sudden, then, then you don't do it anymore. Um, it is something that you're always going to miss. But like I say, it's it's we're fortunate enough to still have it on the telly. Um, and I'm still watching and still speak to people in the game and stuff like that. So you always still get your little fix as such anyway. So in terms of like managers that you've maybe played under, you know, you've played under so many good managers, you know, you had Paul Joel at Wigan in the promotion sort of era and stuff like that. You know, so many sort of managers that you could probably name, but as well as sort of players that you've played with, um, if you if you could probably pick maybe one manager and another player that you could potentially sort of say, he's the best I've played with, who would you probably pick? Um, I must admit, Andy Kilner at Stockport. Yeah. Andy, I'm saying that, I mean, so I, I was lucky at Stockport to have Andy Kilner. I mean, even Gary, I mean, Gary Megson. Yeah. People used to go. A lot of players in the game used to used to um, used to bad mouth them in a way um, to each other and, and, and from club to club and stuff like that because of his his managing techniques. But at the end of the day, all he wanted you to do was go out there and get one hundred percent. And if people found that being a bit bullying or a bit um, over the top, then you know the I main sort of thing. It's um, oh, that's all he wanted from me. And he used to say to you, "Go and give a hundred percent. Give me hundred percent. I'll be hundred percent to you." And he was, he was great to me because I was just one of them where I'd go out and I'd run through a brick wall for him because I knew he'd stick up for me in the, in the dressing room and he'd stick up for you anyway, you, you, anyway you want him to. Do you know what I mean? But he just wanted players to put the foot in to run around and play for the badge and everything else, do you know what I mean? So that's all he wanted them to do and some of them thought it was too much to ask. Yeah. And they're, with, they're the ones that have a problem with them. So with the player then, who would you pick with the player that you played with? The best player I played with and the funniest one as well, Jimmy Bullard. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely hilarious. He was quality at Wigan though, that you know, in that season as well. I can remember him and he, he was such a player, weren't he, back then? What yeah. was it like to have him in the squad? It was great, like I say, I mean, we... I must admit, we didn't know, well, I don't know whether anyone knew a lot of him, should I say, when he was at Peterborough, I'm not too sure, but I remember playing Peterborough away, and uh, there was this kid, he was just chirpy as anything on the game, just proper chirpy, and then three weeks later, I walked through the dressing room, and um, Paul, do you manage to sign him for, I think, 75 grand, I think it was, and, um, and then obviously, well, not obviously, but he's... Um, He's signed up, and then the first game I played with him was the Saturday. I think we played Wick, uh, Wickham away and won 2 0. And it was the first time I played with him. It's just absolutely comical all the way through the game. You're thinking, I can't believe this is going on on the pitch, sort of thing. The, the things we were saying to their players was unbelievable. Well, so, what's the craziest team? thing he did on the pitch? Yeah, I was going to say that. Well, this was his first game, and this was. We're playing Wickham away, and all the way through the game, we just kept shouting to him, like there was a goal kick, and he'd shout, Dins, Dins, what? How bad are these two? 
on about the two midfielders. <laughs> in the pair of them, I looked at each other, I'm like, who are you talking to? He, looked, he, went, Sh-. he said, you're absolutely horrendous, you two, this and that. Anyway, about five minutes later, the, the Wigan made a substitution and the board went up and it was one of these midfielders. And Jimmy went, I'm not being funny, mate. You've done well the last 55 minutes. <laughs> so he goes off the pitch. The sub come running. I don't know who the sub was. And Jimmy's like, straight away, but you would only been there 10 seconds. He went, I'm not being funny, mate. You must be absolutely shite if he's keeping you out of the team. <laughs> I've played on the pitch for like 55 minutes. And this it was every game that was, by the way. Every game. Quality in it. And well, I think that's, in some ways, that gets you through the game, don't it? It does. Because, again, football to Jimmy was just, a, like I say, he played, he, oh, as you, as just the clips you see after that were Hull and everything else. He just used to, he, he loved the game, like I say. But always a favourite smile on his face. Never downbeat or anything else. And like I say, it's, um, like I say, but he, he had the quality to go with it as well, as I mean. So in terms of training sessions, then, what about... Is there any, I don't know, is there any stories that you can share with us um, that, you know, because he's obviously a bit of a comical lad, you know, a bit of a Jack the Lad as well. So is there anything that, you know, was you a victim of his of his pranks or anything like that? No, I was quite fortunate, to be honest with you. He used to pick on the other ones. Um, I think he knew better because I used to look after him on a Saturday, so he used to look after me during the week. Yeah. <laughs> you were the enforcer, weren't you? He, he'd, yeah. get, he'd, get, he'd get, he'd do all the d- dirty talk and you'd, you'd back him up, wouldn't you? You'd be the exactly. one to have to... I think that's why it was so terrific because everyone, there was always someone there to look after him. They had to. Yeah. They were had to. But um, no, he was, like I say, the, some of the things that he used to do, like I say, was just unbelievable, like unreal sort of thing. But uh, yeah, funny stories of another day. <laughs> well, Tony, mate, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on tonight. Absolutely brilliant. Like, it's, it's good to have a proper chat, you know, with a football and, and see the, you know, the other side of football. And, Tonight, you've given us a, a great insight. And obviously, the, the love of the game is, is a big thing nowadays that you yeah. don't see with a lot of players. And I think you've really explained that and made it clear that there are players out there that, that do love the game, but don't get given the chance. And to be honest, mate, when I remember you playing, there weren't many people that got past you in the midfield. Do you know what I mean? And that's, that's the kind of player that, that any club would aspire to have. Um, I've got one final question for you tonight, mate. Yeah. We're trying to get one player on this podcast. Um, and you know we we find it really hard to get in contact with him. Uh, but have you ever played with or know Delhi Adebola? Yeah, I played with. Yeah, I played against Delhi loads of times. Big centre forward, crew, uh, crew Alexander, Birmingham. Um, funny enough, I played a charity game. I still play for Wolves charity matches. Um, the the call or um, Wolves All Stars, but there's probably one star amongst them, and that's my leaves. Um, the rest of the just used to play for them, don't one of them. Um, but we played a charity match against Birmingham um, about 18 months ago when Daly was playing then, to be fair. And he was, he was probably smaller now than he was when he was playing, to be fair. But, um, <laughs> yeah. So he, he loved his athleticism a bit then? Uh, just a bit, yeah. Um, he's, he's still got his elbows, so that used to chuck at you every now and again. But... Um, <laughs> I've not, but that's a long time I've seen Delhi actually was playing the charity match. But yeah, I've not got any contact with him at all now. Oh, right. So oh, the search totally. goes on, boys. The search goes on. It doesn't matter who we speak to, no one can get hold of Delhi Adabola. Um, <laughs> Tony, mate, it's been brilliant. Thanks for coming on tonight, yeah, mate. Thanks, Tony. Thanks for listening. Cheers. All right, take care, buddy. Cheers. Thanks a lot.